Hello, I'm Troy Abels from Hanford, California, and you are listening to Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In 1902, Reed Smoot was an apostle for the LDS Church and was elected to Congress. However, Congress was concerned that the LDS Church was practicing polygamy. Was that true? There was the 1890 Manifesto, which supposedly outlawed polygamy, but we'll find out that it was continued to be practiced secretly, and they really put Senator Smoot on the hot seat for several years. Lindsay Hanson Park is the host of your Polygamy podcast, and we'll talk about Senator Smoot, as well as this time period after 1890 in which polygamy was secretly practiced. Check out our conversation. Hey, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Beyond the Blocks is an awesome podcast, and it seeks to center the narratives of the marginalized in conversations on Mormonism. A black lifelong member and queer theologian, Brother Jones and Brother Knox, seek to fill the gaps between Mormon theology and Mormon culture that find all kinds of identities may claim a seat at the table of Christ. So check out Beyond the Block. It's a great podcast. Now back to our conversation. So so the idea is that Woodruff is a dummy prophet, and I would say the historical records don't back this up. Everything I know about Woodruff is he was... He was really conflicted. He was really stressed out about this, and so he issues what they call, he didn't do it alone. There was a lot of debate within the quorum, so you have to understand we're talking about all polygamous men. So we're not just talking about a practice or a policy, we're talking about their families, right? We're talking about the things they suffered, and the things that they encouraged other people to suffer for. This is not a, this is not a small thing. So there's conflict in the quorum at this time, and I think it's one of the least understood parts of Mormon history. Mike Quinn is doing an amazing amount of research on this, but he's actually writing a book um, up until 1925 about this period, which is so great because I think this is where things get really, really interesting. You have apostles um, like John W. Taylor, uh, gosh, who are Cowley, Matthew Cowley, all these people who are practicing and performing plural marriages while other apostles, J. Reuben Clark and folks like that, are like breaking down, busting down on these practices. And that's more under Joseph F. Smith, so we'll get there. But Woodruff issues the manifesto. He wouldn't be a leader of the church for very long. He issues the 1890 manifesto, which says, okay, we're, we're abandoning polygamy. And it really was a reaction to federal pressure. Um, it had to do with their assets. It had to do with the politics. It had to do with the threats being made from the federal government. And th- I really think the church was backed into a corner. Um, when you have that much federal pressure and focus and to sort of line the pockets and the interests of Washington, D.C., which is what was happening, he, he was in a tight spot. So he issues a manifesto and effectively... Line the pockets of Washington, D.C. through campaign donations? Is that what you're saying? Well, like I said... Else? There are people, and this is a whole other thing, and there, there are some really great historians that have talked about this, and you can look at their research. Lori Stromberg has done an essay in um, Persistence of Polygamy books about it, and Sally Gordon, this is like her specialty to talk about all of this stuff. But basically the idea is Republican and federal laws were being shaped using Mormon polygamy as like a, a ploy. I guess, as a propaganda strategy. So, and we see this today. A campaign issue. A campaign issue. It's it's a, you know, you just tell these horrible stories about Mormons and the terrible things that are happening to Mormon women. Mormons are the boogeyman. Exactly. And so then you can use that to get, you know, gain political traction. And and there was, you know, Mormons have always been sort of used for that purpose. And Mormon women especially. Mormon women, I think, have been used by both sides, by their leadership and their local government and the federal government you know, to get the interests of, (laughs) or not necessarily focus on what was best for the women or what they wanted. But anyway, so Woodruff issues this, and most people understood this at the time, like, oh, gotcha, we get what's going on here. He's telling the government, we're not doing it. We'll just keep doing it, but we'll just be quiet about it like we've been doing. But because of that, you know, at the turn of the century, you know, we have technology starting to evolve. Um, travel, communication is starting to evolve. So Mormons are getting, are integrating with the outside world more and more and more. And because of that, I think that polygamy was sort of seen as uh, not cool anymore, sort of weird. 
So with with this manifesto, it's kind of seen as like that's something that grandpa did. Like that's that's the old thing, but we're like hip and modern and Mormonism can be hip and modern. And so what's really interesting is for several generations you have entire families who they had lived this thing and they were seen as the elite. So entire neighborhoods downtown, which we were talking about earlier that still exists, they were for the elite families, which were plural families. And plural families are so dynastic because marriages are, plural marriages are dynastic. You're tying families together. You're tying these kingdoms together. So it's really this like complicated network of people. So the colonies in Mexico, for example, Mormons uh, were settling, we call it the Book of Mormon Belt, all the way down to Mexico, all through, you know, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, uh, Idaho, Canada. So you have these settlements, and there were colonies in Mexico where there were these elite Mormon families. The Romney family, for example, Mitt Romney's family was one in the colonies. And they've been practicing plural marriage. All of a sudden, they have to you know, flee Mexico because of the war that's happening down there. And they end up in Utah, and there's stories of these elite Mormon families. Which war is it what happened? Um, it, oh, gosh, you asked me. The Mexican-American War where... Uh, well, Utah was part of Mexico back then. No, 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 this is, this is, a, this is a Pancho Villa. So Pancho Villa. So he comes in, and the colonies are threatened. And to be perfectly honest, I haven't studied the ins and outs of this war, but I know enough to know that that the political structure of what was happening in Mexico um, at the time threatened the safety of white Americans who were living down there. So a lot of them came here as refugees. And in fact, there's a lot of Mormons on the border towns of like Texas and Mexico because of this. But, but the stories are they came to Salt Lake after this manifesto. So we're talking turn of the century. Yeah. Um, and they come here and they're used to being the elite families and they show up in these ward houses and families entire families won't even sit on the same pew with them because they're polygamous so now all of a sudden the tables have turned where you have monogamous are seen as a little bit better okay, so this war is after 1890 because we have the manifesto in 1890 yeah i can Wilford look it up Woodruff, for you um outlawed not really outlawed polygamy but said we're we're going to follow the law of the land but the in, what I understand is, yeah, we're going to follow the law of the U.S. the U.S. law of the land. Uh -huh. But in Mexico, they don't have a law. So if you go to Mexico, you can continue to uh, obtain a polygamous marriage. And yeah. so even after 1890, some people would go to Mexico, and the mission president there, whoever, would uh, do a, a polygamous ceiling. Yeah, and so we'll get there. So yeah, that's true. So uh, some of the the apostles under um so let's so see even, Pancho even Villa, under wilford woodruff even though he's the one you know we, we, we a lot of mormons will say we stopped plugging in 1890 which no which is kind of true but not really it's not true at all um i i would say that we could argue that you stopped it officially in 1904 and, and we'll talk about that in 1904 yeah um Pancho Villa was assassinated in 1923 so we're talking the turn of the century stuff okay. that, that this is happening but um yeah so you have colonies in, in Canada, carts in Canada, a lot of Mormon fundamentalists and elite Mormons come from that. And in Mexico. So just right along the Rocky Mountains, right? Yeah, <laughs> from from really. Mexico to Canada, really. You really do. And so, so we're talking culture is not linear, right? So these things are happening sort of like in this mix, like picture like a mixing bowl and all these, these things being mixed in. But basically, uh, yeah, you have, you have this attitude start to shift. And this is where you start to see men in the quorum now. They start to excommunicate polygamous men for performing plural marriages after the manifesto. This and is about 1904, because that's because yeah, yeah. So I'm getting there, but so and then they're for they're calling for the first time ever to the quorum some monogamous men, and because of that, the attitudes start changing. So that's what I wanted you to note. Like during this time from. We're on the underground. We're all on the same page. Over the course of, I think, 30 years, polygamy is slowly on the decline in the hearts of people as far as it's not hip, it's not modern, it's weird. And that's important because it's going to help you understand how people responded to, first, the 1890 Manifesto. So 1890 Manifesto comes out. Most people don't pay attention to it. In fact, you know, I talk about this in the podcast, but there's some stories of folks in southern Utah who 
didn't even hear about it till a few years later and they're just like eh, you know that's just yeah we know what they're doing again and it became a debate some people were like wait is this really a thing like the church wouldn't do this because they like I lost my first wife because of this because she was opposed to it and they told me that my sacrifice mattered like what the heck they would never do this so that's kind of the attitude that it started to shift and of course the federal pressure now we have Reed Smoot we have all of these things where he's lying essentially to the government and so Reed Smoot let's, let's back up a little bit because people you just threw that name out yeah. and people don't know who Reed Smoot is so tell us who Reed Smoot so is so Reed Smoot was a Mormon senator of course because he was the representative from Utah right and um he he was an apostle also he was an apostle and he was basically i don't even know the scapegoat I, he took he took a lot of heat for mormon polygamy because he's over in washington dc just trying to do what he does okay and so he won the election and i think it was 1900 is that right 1904 uh, 1902 somewhere around there yes i don't so, know i don't so, know somewhere around the turn of the century so he was elected by utah which was now finally uh -huh. a state yeah. Utah got statehood in 1894, following the 1890 manifesto, the federal government said, so finally said, okay. So that's an important part. So 1890, that manifesto functionally helped Mormonism be you more legitimate. Yeah, well, and, and this is where it's crazy, and I don't remember all the details now because it's been a while since I've looked into it, but you have entire stakes that are being excommunicated, like there's one in Idaho because they wanted them to vote for cer certain initiatives, but they wouldn't let Mo Mormons vote. They didn't because see Mormons. Because federal law said we can't trust Mormons. Exactly. Well, and for good reason. I mean, I don't think it was constitutional. There, there's a lot of good uh, historians and lawyers, constitutional law scholars, who who research this time because it brings up so many interesting questions about religious freedom and politics and the role of government and all of these things that Mormons are really challenging. Yeah, so Mormons couldn't serve on juries, couldn't vote. I mean, they were just trying to strip all the rights away because yeah. they were trying to stop polygamy. I mean, that's what it was. They're trying to stop polygamy. And so, like like I said, there are stories of entire stakes, like in Idaho, the stake president cuts them all off, so now they're not Mormons anymore. They go vote, and then they're all rebaptized, <laughs> which is incredible. Yeah, it's so amazing. Um, but that's those are the kind of issues that we're struggling, and it's such a messy time. So... You have this double speak now that's starting to happen in the quorum. By the time Joseph F. Smith becomes the leader, he is an important figure because Joseph F. Smith is whose son? Do you know? He's Hiram's son. He's Hiram's son. Hiram is the brother of Joseph Smith. Hiram was killed in Carthage along with his brother. Joseph F. Smith is an eight-year-old boy, would have seen the bullet-ridden body of his father, saw his mother weep over the grave. Like, this is instilled in him. And actually, the majority of the information that we have from Joseph Smith's polygamy comes from Joseph F. Smith. So what had happened was Joseph Smith dies. He has okay, a son. Before we go to Joseph yeah. Smith, let's go back to Reed Smith for a second. So Reed Smoot was elected as Utah senator, yeah. and Congress said, even though Reed, Reed was an apostle, he was also a monogamist. But Congress refused to seat him, and so we had these Reed Smoot hearings that lasted for like two years. Yeah, and the and the Reed Smoot hearings, so basically he is brought in front of the government. They ask him all kinds of questions. They ask him all kinds of questions about Mormonism, Mormon theology. We actually, if you read the transcripts, it's a fascinating look at, at Mormon theology. So they go cosmology. through the temple ceremony they as through, well. It's in the congressional record. They do, and, and they ask him all kinds of questions about polygamy, and so he is forced to answer, and I think he answers dishonestly sometimes, but again, you're looking at this idea of, we have well, a... It's not just Reed, because they pulled in the prophet, who, who by then, I'm not sure, was that... So, Joseph F. Smith... Was that Joseph F. Was Smith? Was forced to... He was, he was president of the quorum. I don't think he was the prophet, though, was he? Right, but I don't... I think Woodruff had died by now, I believe. Hold on, just let me see. I can look this up. Okay, so let's jump back in here. So, we, so let's talk about Reed Smoot in the 1900s and, and that sort of time period. You, you did mention that Reed wasn't the first... Um, Monogamous. I'm trying to remember. I, I wish I could remember. It's been like a few years since I've covered this, so I don't remember. But they about this time, they start putting monogamous into the leadership. And Reed Smoot was one of those. B.H. Roberts was actually, um, he had some, uh, what was his 
what was his role? He was elected to something, not senator, before Reed Smoot. But this is still at the time when we're not sure if Mormons are allowed to vote, you know, like if they are even, if they are even considered citizens of the United States, if they have the rights of United States citizens. So when Reed Smoot um, is elected, it's about a four-year struggle where, you know, people are saying, does he even get to, to do this? Is he even yeah. legitimate? Is he, does he even get to be here? And one of the things that they focused on in his hearings were Mormon oaths, and this is why you talked about the temple ceremony earlier, but there were oaths in the temple that, oaths of vengeance that, um, were that fundamentalists still adhere to, which basically have the promise that they would avenge the, the murder of Joseph Smith until the third and fourth generation, basically. So w what it was is um, after Joseph Smith was killed, this was sort of added into the temple where there was this oath that you would take where you would avenge the deaths of the prophet from those who had murdered him, which is, you know, why Mountain Meadows massacre and all these other things are sort of justified under these oaths that, you know, ends justify the means and we can do anything to outsiders. So the federal government was like, why are we going to let Mormons in when we know, we've heard for years about these oaths. You you want to kill us. Like, you know, what we sh what should we do? And, of course, polygamy becomes the battering ram for that, and so they're in this conflict. Joseph F. Smith is the prophet now at the time. He, um, he encourages Reed Smoot in, in these hearings, and he's really, so, so this is why I brought up Joseph Smith, because the important thing that you have to understand is Joseph Smith III is Joseph Smith Jr.'s son. Emma Smith rejects polygamy, the, uh, her church that stays in Nauvoo, the RLDS as we know it. Um, she believes her son Joseph III has the most um, paperwork, most credentials to take on the church. There's a good argument for that case. So she she backs him. And of course, all the saints come west who are practicing polygamy, the Brighamite tradition. And you have Joseph F. Smith and his cousin, Joseph Smith III, Hiram's son, Joseph's son. And they have about a 20-year battle. And I have, I have an episode where we talk about this because I think it's fascinating. We call it dueling cousins where Joseph the third is really trying to understand why people would call his father a polygamist. His mother's denying it. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. He just wants to know the truth. And by most accounts, all accounts, he's a good guy. He's an honest guy. He's just trying to understand. So he makes a few trips out to Utah. And Joseph F. Smith is really committed to proving that Joseph and Hiram were polygamists. So the majority of the affidavits that we have that attest to Joseph Smith's plural wife, we come from, come from Joseph F. Smith. He collected those. He collected these affidavits to prove to his cousin that, yes, our fathers were polygamous. And so to have him be the guy in this position now, he practiced polygamy, he suffered for it, and now, he, now he's got a senator and an apostle going through all this stuff politically. Mormons are making news headlines all the time. One thing I did want to say about Wilford Woodruff, because I skipped over this, Wilford Woodruff gives this manifesto, here's why people didn't take him seriously. Wilford Woodruff was still taking on plural wives after the manifesto. We know that in 1896, um, 1896, 1896, so the, the manifesto issued well, 1890. that was the year Utah became the state. I said 1894 earlier, I think it was 1896. Yeah. Exactly. There is an account in Wilford Woodruff's uh, diary about him meeting a uh, Madame Mountford. Mountford? Lydia, Madame Lydia Mountford. She was, um, at the time they would have speakers, famous people go on the speaker circuit and travel from all over and, you know, sort of give these speeches and Madame Mountford was one of those. She was a very gifted speaker, very, you know, refined and she was from the East and I can't remember all about her, but she meets Wilford Woodruff in Utah. They fall in love. He's smitten with her. His his diary, after meeting her, is obsessed with her. He writes obsessively about her. There's an account of him meeting her on the ocean in San Francisco, so off of United States property, where he's sealed to her as a plural wife, after his own manifesto. And he's not the only one. I mean, some some scholars don't take that very seriously because it's just, you know, they're like, well, it could have been just a dinner party, and he was using flowery language. No, like, if it were just that, that would be one thing. But you have his own apostles who are, you know, Brigham Young's son, who was 
down in Mexico, he's marrying people, um, and that was tolerated for a while, like you said, because it's not, we, they understood at first that, we, well, we just can't practice polygamy on United States soil, but we can still do it in Mexico, we can still do it in Canada. And that idea persisted for a long, long time. But when those apostles kept doing it amongst their family and friends, and there's, this, there's this amazing story, and this is in Joseph F. Smith's time, but where he has one of his apostles performing a plural marriage for a family or sanctioning a plural marriage for a family in southern Utah, and then one of his other apostles has to go in and excommunicate them for it. And he's kind of like turning a blind eye. You know, he's got this conflict where half of his apostles are performing these marriages and the other half are cracking down on them, right? And so there's this huge, huge, messy struggle that people don't even realize. And so this is why Mike Quinn is writing his research up until 1925 because there are documented more and more and more. And Mike is actually looking for some. So if any of your listeners have ancestors that were plurally ma married after 1890, up until 1925, Mike Quinn is looking for those marriages, and he's writing a book on it because there are so many, and um, they're LDS leaders. And so this is where we get the break off to Mormon fundamentalism. It's about this time. So Joseph F. Smith now, Reed Smoot's coming in. Wilford Woodruff tried his best, couldn't even keep to it himself, you know, obviously. Joseph F. Smith now, you know, he believes in the principle. He fought hard for the principle, but he understands that, like, He's very plugged into this federal, you know, investigation with the church. Their assets are still being threatened. So he issues the second manifesto in 1904. And it's basically like, no, seriously, guys, we really have to stop. <laughs> like, we really have to stop. And this is where you really get, I look at it now, people say, you know. Is it, this probably in a reaction to his congressional testimony that he's like, we, yeah. We've got to stop. Praying. I think you can absolutely draw the line. I mean, people will say it's a revelation that God just wanted it removed from the earth. Absolutely not. Like, there's no theological basis for that because the things that these same guys were teaching just 10 years earlier contradicts that idea. This is an eternal ordinance, this is a holy, sacred thing. It's never to go away. And, you know, Ann Wilde, who you interviewed, she has this whole little packet where she collects, because, you know, it's been a struggle for like LDS historians who want to sort of defend the history in a faithful way like Brian Hills he'll say it was never polygamy was never essential for salvation and Ann Wilde's like nope 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 I've got this whole stack of things of all these leaders saying that it's essential and whether it was essential or not so many Mormons understood it to be you can read pioneer journals you can read journals of this time women understood that that is what they had to do to get into heaven that is just what people understood so for Joseph F. Smith to do this was no small thing I think because of his his uh, history his commitment to the practice he had a lot of credibility so a lot of people took him seriously this time but do we know how old he was when Joseph and Hiram were killed he was eight he was eight years old yeah. so he saw that horrible he saw thing. it and you you know there Joseph F. Smith is an interesting character he was an alcoholic he, when he would drink, he would beat his wife, one of his wives. Um, you can read about it. There's a, I think it's called, it's a dialogue article called Beyond the Beard, the Trials and Tribulations of Young Joseph F. Smith or something. It talks about this where he was actually beating her in the street with like a, like a stick, like a reed. <laughs> it's not good. But um, there's an argument to be made that he, he and all these other Mormon patriarchs who really shape our culture, like they're victims, survivors of intergenerational trauma, you know. Mormonism was a violent place for a long time for several generations and Joseph F. Smith comes out of that violence. He would have been there. The early Mormon history, all the all the really terrible conflicts, he would have been up close and personal for. That would, I can't even understand the impact that that would have in shaping how he viewed the world, right? And so, and I think we see that in how he dealt with conflict later on and how he coped with things later on. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lindsay Hansen Park. In our next conversation, we'll talk about the last apostle to be caught secretly practicing polygamy. It happened to 19, in the 1940s. You have Amy Brown Lyman, who is apostle, her, she's the Relief Society president, Amy Brown Lyman. She's amazing. Her husband was an apostle for the church, Richard Lyman. One morning, it's a sad, sad day in Kimball's diary. He writes 40s, about right? this. We're, yes, 1940s. The 1940s. I'm just, yeah, we'll go back. But the apostles burst into Lyman's bedroom 
and there he's lying in bed with someone that's not Amy Brown Lyman. It's his spiritual plural wife that he was fellowshipping 20 years earlier and had kept her as a plural wife for 20 years. Some would call her a mistress. That's what Amy Brown, that's how Amy Brown Lyman saw it. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.